Hello everyone, welcome to another Quad Education Test Prep Fundamentals video. My name is Tom, and today we're talking about IT. Well, what is IT, maybe you're asking? Well, in addition to talking about IT, we're also talking about THEY, and HE, and HIM, and SHE, and WHO, and WHOM. Yes, today we're talking about pronouns. Pronouns is a topic that appears in both the SAT writing and ACT English, so let's take a look. Okay, let's talk pronouns. So. I will say there aren't a ton of pronoun questions, at least not in the same way that punctuation questions appear with a ton of frequency on these tests. So there's maybe three to five of them per test, but they are one of those kinds of questions where if you know the rule, you can get it every time and that's easy free points. And if you're not confident with it, it's just gonna break your focus while you're going through these tests. So absolutely a great topic to just have down and have free points for. Also a quick note and probably worth mentioning, the SAT and ACT are always going to be super specific with when we have gendering with pronouns. So there's never going to be any sort of ambiguity there. So you will always know whether someone is singular female, singular male, or if there's plural folks involved in a situation. So that's never going to be an issue. So let's go ahead and talk about pronoun agreement and what it is. Well, what pronoun agreement means is making a pronoun match to what's called its antecedent. And so the antecedent is what a pronoun refers to. So if I were to say, Frederick is going to the fair, he is very excited, the antecedent of he would be Frederick. And so one instance of pronoun agreement where it's a little trickier is the Coca-Cola company is famous for its astronomical marketing budget. They spent more than $4 billion on advertising in 2022 alone, which is true, by the way, I looked that up, it's a lot of money. But this is a way people speak, and at least in the United States, this word right here, they, is incorrect. Now, in Europe, they do collective nouns for companies, but we're not in Europe, or at least the tests are not in Europe, so we're not going to think about it that way. But in America, at least, they is not correct when you talk about a company because you can have plural companies. And so instead of they, what you should be saying here is it, it being the Coca-Cola company. So when we have this sort of baseline pronoun agreement question, what we'll need to do is match the pronoun with its antecedent and the plurality, which is to say singular versus plural of that antecedent. So the antecedent is singular, then the pronoun needs to be singular, which is the case here. And if it were the Coca-Cola and Pepsi companies, it would be they, because that would be plural companies. Okay, and so moving right along, we say how to spot pronoun questions. Well, pretty easy, because what you'll see is a pronoun will be underlined. And just for reference, pronouns would be, for the first person, we'd have I, second person would be you. And I suppose the as an object pronoun, we go me right there to introduce that subject. For the object for you, it's just you and you, there's no difference. We have he and she and it for the subjects for the third person. And then we have him, hers, and its for the third person, for subject pronouns and object pronouns, and then we have we for what we, we would call the fourth person, and then we have us for the object of the fourth. The fifth person it doesn't really exist in English, that's still just gonna be you, and then for the sixth person, that's they and them. So those are, just for reference, all the pronouns. And then, and, and with who and whom, which we'll talk about in a second as well. And so when we have one of these pronouns underlined, what it's going to be our job to do is make sure that our pronoun matches up with the antecedent. And so in this case, we have the driver's test was his first time he ever hit a curb. And so his here is going to match with he, so that's going to be correct. We wouldn't say that it's its because he isn't in it. And there we've specified that it's he. And then it's, we can talk about maybe this in a minute, what that would mean. So... So moving on to our next question type, we have ambiguous pronoun reference. And so for those of you who don't know, ambiguous means unclear. So an ambiguous pronoun reference would be to say that it is ambiguous or unclear as to what a pronoun refers to. And so in this instance, we have the example sentence, the first time that the paleontologists excavated the ancient burial site, they found a sarcophagus, a well-preserved chariot, and a metal axe. It is the oldest example found to date. And so the problem in here is what is it? What is it? We don't know what it is because it could be the sarcophagus because that's a singular inanimate object. Same so for well-preserved chariot and for metal axe. We don't know if it's Elipis axe, chariot, or sarcophagus. So in that case, it is ambiguous. We don't know. And the way that we fix this is we need to change this word to something like 
the chariot or the axe is the oldest example found to date. So it actually specifies what this is in this case. Moving on, we have who versus whom, a classic point of discussion for folks. When is it who and when is it whom? Well, there are a couple of ways to remember this, all of which I've taught over the various years. I will give you the two ways that I found that are the most effective. And so the first one is the noise that people use to remember who versus whom. So the way that goes is he who, him whom. which is just a really fun noise to, to make and to help you remember. He who, him, whom, he who, him, whom, he who, him, whom, he who, him, whom. And if you make that noise, it helps you remember which one goes where. And so what that means is he always goes where who would go and him always goes where whom would go. So the so classic example is who or whom is at the door. And so that would be you thinking, well, do you say he is at the door or him is at the door? And because you'd say he is at the door, the answer would be who. Another example might be, to whom or who did you give that letter? Well, would you say that you gave that letter to him or to he? And well, since you would never say, I gave that letter to he, it would be whom because of the M. Important thing to note here, who and whom are in fact not plural or singular. So it really also is they, who, them, whom. So instead of he being at the door, it could easily be that they are at the door. That's important to remember because sometimes it will be plural. And so now let's talk about the second way that I recommend people remember this. So this one is a tiny bit more technical, but bear with me and I think you'll find that it is actually more effective. So we need to talk about objects versus subjects as pronouns. So subject pronouns get to do things. He goes to work. She goes to work. You can't say him goes to work, right? So that means that he is a subject pronoun. Refer back to my video on punctuation for subjects, verbs, and objects in a sentence. You always need the subject and the verb. You don't always need the objects to make a complete sentence. But anyway, as for objects, you would never say that I gave that letter to he, which is to say he is a subject and him is an object because you would say they gave that letter to him or to us or to them. So understanding that, we know that who is a subject pronoun and whom is an object pronoun. And the next little thing we need to define is a preposition. So take a second to see if you remember what a preposition is. So what is a preposition? Well, a preposition is a locator word. So that could be anything that tells you where something is. So it's like in, in the basement, on the table, with my friends, gone for a walk within 20 minutes of my house. Anything that locates or relates in that case is a preposition. And so the rule is look to the word before the choice of who versus whom. And if that word before the who versus whom choice is a preposition, it will always be whom. That's to say, whom will always follow a preposition. If the word before the who versus whom choice is not a preposition, then it's not going to be whom. So that's a really important, important point to remember. And generally in English, object pronouns always follow prepositions in general. And so for the last little point here, we have and who and versus whose and whose. So we have the word whose and the word whose here, which is going to relate pretty closely to my next point. So if we have a, an apostrophe with a pronoun, that means that it is a contraction. And a contraction in this case would just be who is, or I suppose who has, um, who, who's got the ball, who has got the ball, and who's without an apostrophe, pronouns generally without an apostrophe that ends with an S in there is going to be possessive. So apostrophe means contraction, no apostrophe means possession. So whose house is this? To whom does this house belong? And segueing very nicely, we have this sort of it's versus it's versus it's question. So when do we which? And so I get this question quite a lot because the question, the tests will absolutely 
test this. So what is the difference? So as I just mentioned, actually, very conveniently, English is consistent in saying that if there is not an apostrophe in a pronoun, it's going to be possessive. So this is to say belongs to it. This car is old. Its tires are flat. And this one right here, it has a, an apostrophe. So that means that this is a contraction. IT apostrophe S is going to mean it is. That is what it means. So wonder no more. IT apostrophe S. It is. ITS is possessive. And then one last thing to wonder about is ITS apostrophe. So you will occasionally, if not frequently, see this on both the ACT English and SAT writing. So what does ITS apostrophe mean? Well, refer back to our punctuation video about what S apostrophe means. Well, whenever we have an apostrophe after the S, it's supposed to mean plural possessive. But the issue you may notice is that um, we actually already have a word for plural possessive of its. So like I said, these, this car is old, its tires are flat. These cars are old, their tires are flat. So if we already have a word for plural possessive, what does ITS apostrophe mean? Well, what it means is nothing. It doesn't mean anything at all. What it means is wrong. So if you see this on any answer and any test, that's immediately you down to three guesses because it can never be correct because it's not a word. I like to say that ITS apostrophe is less of a word than ain't because technically ain't is, a, is not a word, but we still use it. Not only is ITS apostrophe not a word, but we also don't use it. So never correct on that one. Okay, that's it for learning today. As usual, we have two practice problems. Give this portion a try and see how you do. Okay, let's take a look. The five stadiums were constructed in the late 1990s by a well-respected construction company. However, each of the architects whom were in attendance on the day construction finished was notably less than confident about the longevity of these buildings. So first of all, the was here, maybe you're like, oh, it's a little awkward, but it's each. And so maybe subject verb there. Remember, each goes with was, uh, and so it's just one architect at a time. But apart from that, the decision we need to make is whether it's who or whom here, or who or whose, I suppose. So we need to say to ourselves, all right, well, is it, it's not gonna be who is, each of, the architect, each of the architects who is were does not make sense. And you also don't own were, so it's not possessive. We can get rid of that. And then we have our classic who versus whom decision. And like I said, you always put a preposition with whom. And architects is not a preposition. That is a person or a profession. And so we're going to go ahead and go with who. All right, second practice problem. See what you can do. All right, let's take a look. The last time the United States saw a run on its banks this bad, it was reeling from a financial collapse, a world war, and an agricultural disaster. Since this was the most well-documented issue, we tend to point to it more often than the other causes. So in this case, what is this? What is this? We don't know what this is because we have a financial collapse, a war, and an agricultural disaster. And we've had a lot of those, and a lot of those were well-documented, but we don't know which one is the most well-documented out of any of the three of them because we're not specifying. And so this is an ambiguous pronoun question, and so we need to be specific. And so this is not specific. These just doesn't work with was. And the collapse is specific, and it is not. It is just as nonspecific as this. And so we need to go with the collapse because we have a financial collapse. That is apparently the most well-documented issue. Okay, that's it for this video. While pronouns aren't the most frequently occurring question types on these tests, there's still something you absolutely need to understand to score in those top tiers. It's also something that you need to have well-polished if you want to be highly effective in written and verbal communication, so there's also that. If you found this material useful, we hope that you'll like and share the video and subscribe to Quad Education. If you require any additional tutoring, please reach out to us. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day.